Hey, I want to do a little warning right now. This case is got some very serious, messed up domestic violence, child abuse, some animal abuse. So listen at your own risk. Mm. This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Chris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, Jen. Hey, Kim. How are you? Big day today. I know. It's a huge day. Ten. It's the magic number. Almost. It is almost the almost magic number. The magic number. Can you believe it? We've got no, ten. No. We're doing ten. It's going to be in the bag soon. And last year at this time, we were doing ten like the day before. We were it crying. Was <laughs> Let's be honest. We were This time last year, we were we crying. Are. Yeah, we were. All right, Jen. Well, I'm excited to... Uh, I've never heard about this little story you got for me, so I'm kind of anxious to hear about it. Why don't you go ahead and uh, take us to your place? That sounded weird. You know what I mean. Yeah. Take us to our murders for today. There you go. This is the first time we are hitting the continent of South Africa. Mm-hmm. And I want to shout out and say a huge thank you to our friend Nicole from True Crime South Africa. There were a lot of names in here that I could not pronounce, so I shot her off an email, and she helped us out. And she also gave me a great resource that I could research this with. So huge thank you, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Anyway, Nicole told me about this book called Strangers on the Street by Mickey Pistorius. Now, fun fact about Mickey is she is a South African forensic or investigative psychologist and author, obviously. She is the first woman in her profession and the first profiler in South Africa. Cool. Is she related to Oscar? I wasn't sure if she'd claim that or not, but she might. Okay. I was just wondering. But a little bit about her. She was involved in more than 30 serial killer cases before she retired in 2000, the year 2000, due to PTSD. I, I Go figure, right? I, I, <laughs> you can see that. She's also recognized as one of the world's foremost psychological profilers by people such as FBI profiler who? Robert Ressler. Oh, cool. You know, I have a usually, I'm kind of weird. I usually sometimes feel, I have a tendency to feel bad for some of these horrible, horrible serial killers. Not me. There's just, yeah, some of them I do, like the ones with a really bad childhood and they're just totally screwed from the beginning. And then I feel badly for these killers and then I feel badly for feeling badly for them. It's just this, this horrible problem. Mickey Pistorius also has empathy for these serial killers. And she says that they are, quote, not monsters. They are human beings with tortured souls. I will never condone what they do, but I can understand them. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, I, like, I'm the same way. I feel badly for the shit that happened to them, but not for what they did. I feel badly for what they went through, but the minute that they become a killer, then I lo- no longer feel badly for them because lots of people have rough upbringings. That does not a serial killer make. But a lot of them also have psychology uh, and I think uh, uh, some of them, issues. Some of them I would say are total monsters, mm-hmm. worse than monsters. At oh, least I monsters agree. are animals, right? Not even animals, because animals only kill when need. Yeah, that's what they, I mean. That's what I meant by know? saying monster. At least monsters. So. You know. All right. As we know, most serial killers seem to have a certain type of victim. Ted Bundy, he killed young, attractive women. They usually had long, dark, straight hair. Co-eds. Co-eds. 
John Wayne Gacy's victim were usually young men between the ages of 16 and 21. And Gary Ridgway murdered sex workers or runaways, kind of like the ones that wouldn't be missed, correct? Yes. The one I'm going to talk to you today had two different types of victims. Oh, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. Stuart Wilkin was one of South Africa's notorious serial killers, killing at least 10 young boys and female sex workers. Oh, that is unusual, really. Mm Mm-hmm. So Stuart was born in 1966 in the city of Boxburg in South Africa. At six months old, he was found abandoned in a phone booth with his toddler sister. The woman who found them was a maid or some kind of domestic worker. When she found them, she took them to her employer, who we only know by the name of Depp, but it's spelled D-O-E-P. Ooh, I was going to say Johnny. Depp. No. Now, Depp, even though he seems like it'd be very nice to take these two kids in, he wasn't a very nice guy. He was very abusive. Stuart claimed while he was living with Depp that Depp burned his genitals with cigarettes Ugh. and that his food would be taken from him and then given to the dogs, which forced Stuart to eat from the dogs' bowls oh, while the dogs were eating. That's horrible. He also alleged that he was forced to watch Depp have sex with with the dogs. Ugh. And then he, f- Depp, forced Stuart to lick his genitals afterwards. <gasps> you definitely need to put a warning on this. That is <laughs> disgusting. And I, d- hell, oh, God. Now, as for Stuart's sister, it's not quite known what happened to her. She, she just kind of disappeared. Stuart never saw her again, or pretty much never saw her at all. Because it's six months. Do you think that guy killed her? We'll find out. Hold, please. Oh, really? Okay. So when Stuart was two years old, the Wilkins family decided to adopt him. They were neighbors of this Depp character. Stuart had, was covered with lice, and he was malnourished, and the Wilkins felt extremely sorry for this poor child. So since the Wilkins needed Stuart's mother's consent to adopt him, his mother came by their house, the Wilkins' house, and she brought Stuart some candy. And at the time, Stuart didn't know that this woman was actually his biological mother. So he had no idea who she was, just showed up, this lady just showed up bringing him candy. And it was only later that he realized who she was. And really, that was the first and only time he laid eyes on his biological mother. Oh. Stuart's adoptive mother said that he was quite a problem child, and she couldn't keep him under control. And he wasn't good at school. Actually, he flunked out of the first grade. And then he flunked out of the third grade three times. What? And only then was he transferred to a special ed class. And in the special ed class, Stuart claims that his teacher encouraged the kids to tease him about being adopted, which honestly was the first time he even knew he was adopted. And he also said that a teacher had another student attack him. But only after he attacked the teacher (laughs) in the first place. But he attacked the teacher and then the school administrator, I guess it is, caned him in front of the entire school for what he did. Ooh. Mm Mm-hmm. When Stuart was eight, he started smoking marijuana. And by nine years old, he claims that a church deacon started raping him. And then later claimed he was sexually abused by the older boys of an industrial school that he was placed in once his mother turned him into the Department of Welfare. And from what I gather, an industrial school is kind of like a reform school here. Mm -hmm. She turned him in because he was just so out of control. Mm -hmm. She could not, no matter what she did, he couldn't do what she needed him to do, which, you know, that had to be pretty bad. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Stewart did finish the 11th grade and then went into the army where, after four months, he tried to commit suicide. Then he went to live with his mother in Port Elizabeth. He started to go to school to work or to get trained, I guess, as a carpenter. But shortly after starting this trade school, he hurt his hand. And so then he just started to live on a disability pension from the state. One night at a nightclub, Stuart met a woman by the name of Lynn. Now, Lynn had a daughter from another relationship. And then on Christmas 1985, Stuart and Lynn had a little girl they named 
Wu An. But yeah, it's spelled W U A N E. And I'm like, there's no way I'd be able to pronounce that. Wu An is the normal girl. Wu An is the fancy snooty girl. <laughs> it is Wu An. Such a name, isn't it? But it's South African name. I'm okay. it's beautiful. So Lynn said that after the birth of their daughter, Wu An, Stuart never wanted to have vaginal sex with her again. Just because I said vaginal sex, I'm not going to say what he preferred, but you guys can gather. That's right. That, that is what mm-hmm. I'm thinking. And not only that, every time Lynn would leave the house and leave him with the kids, when she came back, he would inspect her underwear because he thought she was a sex worker. He knew she was a sex worker. Was she? No. As far as I know, she wasn't. Oh. Huh. Okay. As far as I could tell, she was not. Lynn and Stuart finally married after Wu An was five years old, but the marriage had its problems, obviously. In total, it only lasted for nine years. And it was pretty bad. Lynn would repeatedly have Stuart arrested for smoking marijuana. And then after he was arrested, Stuart would beat her, like physically assault her. And then for a while, he was actually admitted into the psychiatric hospital. And that's where he was diagnosed as a psychopath. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Um, When he came home from the hospital, Lynn called the police again. But this time, Stuart saw them arrive and took an overdose of pills and was put back in the hospital. And after he recovered, he and Lynn divorced pretty much afterwards. So in the early 1990s, Stuart met a woman by the name of Veronica. She had two boys already. And soon she and Stuart had two more children. Hmm. Now, Veronica's parents did not like Stuart whatsoever. They claimed he was sodomizing Veronica's boys. Oh. So they took him to the police and he was charged. Why Hmm? did they suspect that? Do you know? No idea. Okay. Like I said, there's not a lot of really in-depth things on him. I would guess that they saw something or suspected. Like there's a reason. You know what I mean? I could not find anything in-depth. The only thing is this Mickey Pistorius, what she wrote, or everything then on, is pretty much regurgitated from her writings. Mm, Okay. At least there might be some things that I can't read in South African or something like that, or another language, but I could not find anything else. So that's why I was totally relieved when Nicole told me about Mickey Pistorius. After he was charged with sodomizing these boys... Stuart moved out, and he started living in a field that was behind this amusement park where he said he always had happy memories of visiting this amusement park. Mm -hmm. So he just lived, like, homeless, I guess, in this field. And then for some reason, on January 23rd, 1997, the sodomy charges were dropped. A week later, Sergeant Norsworthy of the Port Elizabeth Murder and Robbery Unit gets a phone call from the Child Protection Unit. They've been working on the disappearance of a boy named Henry Bakers. Now, Henry had not been seen since January 22nd, and they wanted Sergeant Norsworthy to investigate because he was last seen with Stuart Wilkin. But not only that, they also found that another girl had been missing two years prior, and she was also last seen with Stuart. The girl's name? Wuan Wilkin. (gasps) What? I did not Mm -hmm. see that coming. I thought it was going to be a sex worker. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Oh, he is a sick, sick, sick puppy. When Sergeant Norsworthy gets all the information, he calls Stuart in for a meeting. When Stuart comes in his office, Stuart introduces himself as Bodie Booer, the name Bodie Booer, which supposedly was a second personality of Stuart Wilkin. In South African, it translates to little brother farmer. Okay. But also Nicole told me that it could be some kind of slur, but I should be fine with saying it. So if oh, thanks, I'm not. Nicole. All complaints so, will forward to you, Nicole. To Nicole Care of, of True Crime, Crime South, Africa. South Africa. Yeah. So if it is a racial slur, I am so sorry. I apologize. So once Stuart comes in, sits down in Sergeant Norsworthy's office. The sergeant starts pointing out all of his certificates of the wall, showing all the training he has of investigating serial killers and how well he did in the classes. I mean, his walls are covered with certificates and covered with pictures of his 
young daughter also. So then the sergeant excuses himself and leaves Stuart alone in his office. A little bit later, the sergeant comes back and just basically says, you know, Stuart, I know that there's something up in that you killed Henry and Wu Wan. Stuart thought for a minute and then confessed that he did kill both. And in fact, he had just had sex with Henry's decomposing body that morning <gasps> become, before coming to Sergeant Norworthy's uh, office. Ah, uh, uh, okay. And then the end, right? Because we're done. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's oh, it. Yeah. He confessed. It's 12 and days. Ha- happy holidays. <laughs> yeah. Stewart also said that he had kept his daughter's body at his hideout or that field behind the amusement park. And he slept with it, like actually slept. And after her body had decomposed, he covered the skeleton with a tarp and spread her clothes out on the ground every night when he slept beside it. Oh, my, my. Okay. All right. I see what we're dealing with here. Okay. Okay. Stuart also said that Wu An had been sexually abused by her stepfather and that he wanted to save her from the life of hell like he had as a child. So that's why he mm-hmm. killed her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, Did he violate her body? I never know. I don't say. know. I would hope not. Yeah. Because since he wanted to save her from the life he had, I'm assuming he would not. Yeah, but but then, I'm not so sure about that. That's the point. I'm not okay, st- go ahead. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But it is his own child. But you never know. But I cannot Mm -hmm. confirm nor deny that he did anything. Stewart then told the sergeant where to find all the bodies. And being the top investigator that Sergeant Norsworthy was, he knew that there were more victims. So he just came out and asked Stewart, you know, okay, how many people did you kill? And without a pause, Stewart said, "Uh, at least 10. Uh, zoinks. Mm Mm-hmm. Stewart then called in a lawyer and he confessed. Not in the prettiest of language, it was said, but he did confess. So I'm going to give you what I know. You ready? I've cut out some of the names, and but I've everything that I know is here. On the night of September 3rd, 1990, when he was still married to Lynn, remember Lynn? Mm -hmm. After he and Lynn had an argument, Stewart met a prostitute by the name of Virginia in Russell Road, Port Elizabeth. She asked him for money for sex. He showed her the money and took her to a nearby school. He had sex with her and then kind of forced her to have anal sex. And when she complained, he took a piece of clothing and strangled her while he climaxed. Oh, lovely. Then he left her body on school grounds. Stuart was only 23 years old when this started. Then on January 10th, 1991, he met Mercia. She was also a sex worker and... She propositioned him. He took her to a park where then she demanded money before she had sex with him. And it pissed Stuart off because he thought he shouldn't have to pay for sex since God had freely given that pleasure to women and men. He was angry, so he strangled her with an article of her clothing and then proceeded to have sex with her corpse. And then happy birthday to me on October 21st, 1991. Stuart met, I, not as old as you are, Stuart met a 14-year-old street child, a child that was living on the streets, and he propositioned the boy to have sex, and according to Stuart, the boy consented. He then took the boy to a park, and then before having sex, the boy demanded money. Well, as we know, Stuart does not like that. He got angry again, and this time the boy tried to run but he didn't make it very far. Stuart sodomized the boy and then strangled him with the clothing while he climaxed. Um, It's said that Stuart got off on what he called this jelly bean effect. He liked it when you strangled somebody and their tongue would poke out of their mouth. Huh? What? That's what would get him sexually aroused. What is that jelly bean? Because it looks like a jelly bean? He called it the jelly bean effect. He liked it when the jelly bean effect happened. Oh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ugh. Sometime between Merry Christmas, everybody, 
I was just thinking I'm going to eat dinner here pretty soon. Are you kidding me? I'm going to be thinking nightmares about jelly beans. Good thing this wasn't at Easter time. You'll never look at a jelly bean again. All right. So sometime between June 1993 and September 93, Stuart met 14-year-old street child again. This time he asked the boy if he would masturbate him for money. The boy allegedly said yes. And Stuart took the boy to the Fort Frederick Museum in Midtown, where the boy masturbated him. Then Stuart forcibly sodomized the boy. And when the boy threatened to inform the police, Stuart strangled him with his belt and then hid the body. On July 27th, 1995, Stuart met Georgina, who was a sex worker, and he met her at a primary school. I'm assuming she was around the primary school. I'm assuming she wasn't. (laughs) Working at the primary school. Um, I'm sorry. I know. Uh, that just struck me as funny. I know. Same. A sex worker at the sex primary worker. school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, where do you work okay. at? At the primary school. He took her to a park. He likes those parks. And proceeded to sodomize her. After which he strangled her with her clothing again. He then took a knife, inserted it into her vagina, and cut it open. <gasps> he sliced off her nipples and ate them. Oh, Jen, and you did not have a warning at the beginning of this episode. This is seriously, I think, one of the Uh, grossest ones we've ever done. I know. It's disgusting. And then threw her clothing into a fish pond. He later admitted to Sergeant Norsworthy that he had been present when some of his victims had been discovered, when their bodies had been discovered in the parks, and that he watched the police process some of the scenes. And he also noticed that they collected hairs from the body and then realized that he should get rid of the victim's clothing to prevent the police from finding hair on them. That's when he realized that's why he took her clothes and threw them in the pond. On September 29th, 1995, Wilkin went to visit his daughter, Wuan, and he claimed that she had complained to him that her stepfather was sexually abusing her. So Stuart took Wuan, who was 10 at the time. He took her to his hideout on the opposite side of town, you know, by that amusement park. And there he strangled her and kept her body. And then when the sergeant asked Stuart whether he had sex with Wu Ann, Stuart answered only that he had checked her vagina and found that she was no longer a virgin. Hmm. Him and T.I. have something in common, pervert. Hmm. That's disgusting. There's no need to do that. In all probability, it said that Stuart had sex with his daughter's body for a while after he killed her. Of course he did. And he, she was not being abused until, until he came he along. Until he came along. Stewart admitted to the sergeant that he would often return to the bodies of the boys he had hidden to have sex with their bodies. I can't even. I That is just so beyond disgusting. And I don't even. Well, to make I, it less disgusting for him, Cam, he said he would insert newspapers into their anuses to prevent maggots uh, from infesting the orifices. Oh, uh, so. Oh, my God. I can't even sit still. He it was disgusting. He was a gentleman. Ooh. He was a gentleman. No, he's a <laughs> he's pervert. He's a big old pervert. I know. Ugh. On May 25th, 1996, Stuart met another sex worker by the name of Katrina, and he met her on like a Albany Road interchange, I guess, like a highway mm-hmm. part. I'm unfamiliar. Probably, she was probably hitchhiking or mm-hmm. something, I would guess. Yeah. He said he strangled her while he was reaching climax and then forced a plastic bag down her throat. Stewart thought that, quote, whores, unquote. Sex workers. Stole money from people because, you know, sex should be free. Yeah, because God gave him that dub. Right. And that's why he hated them. He hated them because they were stealing money from people. And mm-hmm. so he thought it was funny or ironic that he left her body next to a wall of graffiti, and the graffiti said that people should not steal. Oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. Stuart, you're really funny. I'm laughing. Ah, yeah. Sometime between May 1996 and August 1996, Stuart met another street child whom he took to a school, and he sodomized the boy, strangled him, and left the naked body in the schoolyard. Isn't that nice? What is his his connection with like well, the schools and good thing I guess he said, his kids, right? He said that it always reminded him that he was sodomized as a child and he was oh, raped by the yeah. people of the school and being raped by the deacon of the yeah, church. I get that. Oh, I see. I understand now. I didn't. I was wondering what the thing was. Mm-hmm. The so connection. on the 22nd of January, 1997, the final kill, 
Stuart met 12-year-old Henry Baker. Now, he was a child of a woman that he had, just an acquaintance that he had known. Stuart claimed that Henry asked him to teach him all about sex, which you know is so true. You know, there's mm-hmm. no denying. Right. Mm-hmm. You, that's that's what happens. You meet a child and the first thing they say is, could you teach me about sex? Right. A stranger, too. A stranger, yeah. Well, yeah. I kind of mm-hmm. know your mom. Are you kind of know? Yeah. Ridiculous. So Stuart took Henry to a nearby field and told him to undress, which, of course, the boy did. Stuart then masturbated the boy and forced him to have oral sex. Then he sodomized the child as he was screaming, which made Stuart strangle him, which made Harder. Stuart then climax. Climax. Mm-hmm. I wonder and if he is... believes these lies as he told people them. Yes, he willingly came with me. Yes, she was being mm-hmm. abused, so I took her. Uh-huh. Yeah. And this is where it said Stuart preferred to climax as his victims passed their last breath. He called this the jelly bean effect. He said that they were being strangled, their lips would swell, and their tongues protruded. It was this jelly bean effect which caused him to climax. It's disgusting. Isn't that gross? Uh, it's just, it's a no, horrible. Just... All his, uh... Stuart was charged with 10 murders. Stuart was then convicted of seven of the 10 murder charges on February 23rd, 1998. He is currently serving seven life sentences in the St. Albans prison in Port Elizabeth. But that might have changed. Okay. And I'll tell you in a little bit why. But I couldn't find out for sure. Stuart says he suffers from nightmares. Oh, poor Stuart. And claims that the ghosts of his victims are persecuting him in prison. Uh, Poor baby. First of all, first of all, I would haunt his happy ass like there was a no tomorrow. And I say, go for it, ghost. Mm -hmm. You just keep doing it. And persecute, please. South African authorities are determined to make sure that Stuart never escapes or is ever released. Good. Now, Sergeant Norsworthy traced Stuart's biological mother just before he was sentenced. He was able to find the mother. She -hmm. expressed her wish to make contact with her son and claimed Mm -hmm. that she never wanted to abandon him, but was forced to by his dad since she was going to have another baby. She then also said that she had taken oh. back Stuart's older sister, but not so him. So she kept the girl, but not him. She came back, yeah. Well, he uh, maybe by the time he had already been adopted? I guess. But I don't know. Mm. After the sentence was passed, Sergeant Norsworthy informed Stuart that he had found his biological mother and relayed her message of love to him. Stuart then burst into tears. Then later, when Stuart spoke to his biological mother on the phone, He called her mommy. It was the first time in his life that he could ever recall using the word. There was another woman who wrote a book about Stuart, and her name is Rihanna Moten. Interviewed Stuart in prison for the book she was going to write. I'm not even going to begin to pronounce the name of the book, but the English translation is Smell of Death. Oh, ew. Mm. She said that Wilkin has an absolute hatred of women, and I was not permitted to sit at the same table as him or speak directly to him or even have eye contact. He showed no remorse for what he'd done. As for the victims, he clearly felt they deserved it. That's one of the things that makes people like him so dangerous. Then he said... What about those poor little babies he attacked? What'd they do to him? The kids? They wanted money for sex, maybe? I don't know. No. The one one to learn about sex. Yeah, right. Well, please. You don't know. He he liked that jelly bean effect, right? But, oh, stop. Ugh. She asked him, she said, do you feel sorry for the families? His answer, what families? For him, those families didn't exist as people. They're just things. Because mm-hmm. he wouldn't know because he never had that thing. The big mm-hmm. oak. Talk about jelly. Yeah. Jelly, jelly. Look who's jealous. And then on one last final weird note... His first wife, Lynn, Mm -hmm. the first wife, Lynn, mother of Wuan, was in town and had gone into a phone booth to call her third husband. When three men rushed her, they grabbed her, forced her into a car, and the car raced away. Her body was found the next day, and she had been hit numerous times with a brick against her head. And she was so mutilated, they took a long time to even recognize who she was awful. And I don't know whether they ever caught her killers or not. 
But yeah, so that's the all I know of the bow tie booer. <laughs> it's pronounced B O A T T I E booer. Bow tie, bow tie, bow tie bower, something like that. Like, I'm gonna have to look this guy up now because I just I'm yeah. fascinated and disgusted it's at the same time. Totally disgusted. And Mickey goes into an account where like there's different types of cannibals, and like mm-hmm. Jeffrey Dahmer was a sophisticated cannibal because he actually cooked his victims Ugh. before eating, whereas Stewart just ate parts of the body then and there. Raw. Mm, okay. Yeah. Well, I guess that's like, you know, McDonald's yeah. versus Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Yes. Like, there's a difference, you know? So needless to say, I cannot wait to finish the rest of the stories in Mickey's that's book. That's terrible. Mm-hmm. So there's other ones besides this Yeah, one? this one was only one chapter Ooh. long. Oh, and okay. like I so said, we're be hearing some stories from South Africa. Uh huh. Yep. If Good. Nicole will help me pronounce the names, I will gladly. <laughs> and if you haven't listened Good to her thing podcast, Nicole's name is Nicole. Yeah, Nicole. It's easy. I'm well. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. It could be Dwayne or something. I don't know. It's probably not. <laughs> but anyway, she has a great podcast too. If you want to listen to her after you out. listen to all of ours. All right, Jen. Well, that was disgusting. You're welcome. And I wish you would have warned me a little bit earlier on. Yeah, but because it's... I think all the po- episodes we've done on the podcast, I, I'm going to put that one. Pr- it's pretty bad. Mm, I, uh, mm-hmm. Right up there. Yeah. Top three, definitely, of the grossest. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. Pretty bad. Disgusting. Pretty bad. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. All right. Hope you enjoyed that Christmas turkey dinner or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. Don't think about these stories then. Exactly. Ooh. All right. All right, Jen. Well, Tomorrow, 11. speaking of jelly beans, we have an Easter story. Ooh, well, nice. Yeah, yeah. Around the same time, yeah, right? We just tie, tie them all together nicely in a bow. Oh, good. Like a present. Yeah. We don't have like right, a Jen. deranged Easter bunny going no, after us. of course us. not. Okay, good. No. All right, Jen, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Oh, bye-bye. Love ya, even though I'm annoying. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.